Chapter 2 Egypt Latin Army Encampment near Damietta William Good, Gorm said, looking up from where his squire was helping him gird his armor around his rotund figure. William stood by the entrance of the tent flap as if ready to flee at any moment. Gorm sucked in his paunch to allow his squire to fit the straps of his cuirass into place. William, time is short, so I will be brief. I want you mounted and riding with the chivalry tonight when we attack Damietta. Begging your pardon, lord, but I'm not a knight. Gorm's coarse tuft of beard began to twitch, signaling his agitation. Why do you insist on remaining in the infantry, he demanded. The infantry's fate is not of their own making. You know better than anyone that an errant arrow, a well-placed lance, or overwhelming odds can spell the end for an unlucky infantryman. The sword of Democles hangs ever above those in the front line, with one inevitable result. If I did not know better, I might take it into my head that you wish to perish in battle. William shrugged. What could be more noble than to perish in a righteous crusade serving the holy pope himself? Gorm could never be certain whether or not William was genuine, and so said nothing. William took the hint and continued, I am afraid I have never taken to the noble equestrian activities. The last time I charged on horseback, I ended up meeting the enemy with the wrong end of the horse before me. Neither rider nor animal was satisfied with that, let me assure you. Gorm paused to survey the young man before him. Despite the years of war he had seen and the long days being exposed to the blistering sun, his skin had not lost the smooth cast of youth. His ordinarily dark brown hair was lighter now, the sun having leached much of its pigment. Standing a mere five feet eight inches, William was powerfully built across the chest and shoulders. His chin was square and his face much too handsome for this lifestyle. As if his looks were not enough to set him apart, William's armor was different than any Gorm had seen in his decades of campaigning. Rather than plate or mail, or even the thick leather favored by some, William's armor consisted of small overlapping plates fashioned into a shirt that hung to his thighs. The plates were wrapped in leather and embroidered with blue and gold thread. It was clear the armor was designed for maximum mobility without sacrificing protection, but Gorm would not have fully understood its purpose had he not seen William move on the battlefield. His legs were protected by male leggings with thick golden greaves on his shins for extra protection. Despite William's obvious attention to detail, he never wore a helmet to battle. Gorm had often berated him for what he took to be a monumental oversight, but after seeing William's fierce prowess on the field, Gorm could not argue with the results. His weapons, too, were as unorthodox as his armor. His preferred weapon was the spear, though he wore a curved sword which rarely came out of its sheath at his back. In addition, Gorm knew that he always had two sharp daggers with him, one at the small of his back and another tightly strapped to his left thigh. Though his attire was outlandish, taken together it combined to create a strikingly regal appearance that made William instantly identifiable on any battlefield. Gorm sighed. Who are you, William? The young rogue grinned at his commander with a mischievous gleam in his eye. I'm William of York, sir. You still refuse to reveal more than that, eh? It bothered Gorm that William constantly rebuffed his efforts to mentor him, but William's refusal to confide in Gorm hurt more than he wanted to admit. I have told you all that I remember, William sighed. My father was a tanner and my mother a fishmonger. We were poor. When they died, they made me swear that I would serve God honorably. He looked so affected by the memory one could have believed it had happened only yesterday, but Gorm was not moved. Last time your mother was a tanner and your father a fishmonger, and only he was deceased. Your mother was waiting anxiously in prayerful supplication for your return. Oh? William looked surprised. Well, that is what I meant, of course, he said quickly. Reassuming his air of mourning, he added, They so shared each other's burdens that one was inseparable from the other. They even shared the burden of dying? Sir... Does not holy writ command that a man and a woman cleave to one another, becoming one flesh? My parents obeyed this so thoroughly that when my mother died, is it not fitting that I may say they died? It was your father who died, Gorm reminded him. That is what I said. Very well. Keep your secrets if you will, but that does not change the fact that I expect you to be mounted at my side when we ride on Damietta at first light. Your lordship does me too much honor— 
but I fear the infantry would be lost without me, and at this most critical of battles we cannot risk such confusion. There is no need for me to remind his lordship that the outcome of this battle more than most will depend on each unit doing its part. Are you refusing a direct order? Gorm demanded. I am afraid I must risk a lashing at my master's hands. William's voice did not betray even a hint of fear regarding Gorm's formidable anger. I must risk this lashing lest I incur the responsibility for the failure of tomorrow's initiative by not speaking my mind now. "'Confound you, boy!' Gorm roared, pounding a meaty fist on the table in front of him. "'Why do you refuse the honors I would shower down on your head? "'The church has sought Dalmietta for a hundred years, "'and we would not even be here at its gates if not for you. "'Why will you not allow me the pleasure of championing a brilliant young man and a ferocious warrior? "'Oh, I fear you ascribe to me much that is not deserved. "'In battle I mostly find it convenient to hide behind others until it is finished.' I believe my noble lord's mount has been my shield on more than one occasion. Gorm pounded the table again, but William continued undeterred. Sir, I but fear that the simple heart of a peasant, as beats in my breast, would swell with such honors and, like fateful Icarus, I would fly too close to the sun of chivalry, only to have my dreams dashed on the rocks of reality for my vain glorious aspirations. Gorm's anger melted, and despite his frustration, he grinned. I know you are having sport of me, William. I should lash you for that. My back is ever ready for your noble whip, Sir Knight, William said, and then began fiddling with the leather thongs of his armor as if he would remove it for his lashing. But I fear the weather has made his armor unmanageable and I cannot remove it. Confound you, William, Gorm said, laughing. Well then, what would you have me do for you? William stood not speaking. When he finally broke his silence, he said simply, when the day is won tomorrow, I must beg leave of you. Of course, that is only fitting. Take as much time as you need, Gorm said dismissively. I do not make myself clear. I must beg leave of you permanently. Gorm stared at him. You will leave us? I believe my work here is complete. Gorm's eyes dropped to the table. How long has it been now? Four years? I cannot conceive of going to battle without you after all that time. I never thought I would say such the first time I saw you riding toward us that day as a brash young volunteer. I thought then that you must be running from something. But I suppose now you have outrun whatever it was, eh? He smiled. Well, I managed for fifty years before we met, and I can continue when you have departed. Very well. If leaving is what you wish, then it shall be as you say. His voice cracked slightly, and he began absently fiddling with the plume of his helmet on the table in front of him. I still remember when you joined our band. I was not sure what you were. Come to think of it, I am still not completely sure what you are, but one thing I know is that you are a heaven-sent scourge to the moors. Scourge to the moors, perhaps, William allowed, but I am afraid you do err greatly in your assumption that I am heaven-sent. Not I, Sir Knight. Does not the Lord use the wicked to punish the wicked? Gorm did not respond. William nodded, satisfied he had been understood, and turned to leave. "'William, stay a moment,' Gorm said, aware that William was retiring without being formally dismissed. He had always afforded this boy far too much license, but it seemed impossible to discipline William as he might other soldiers. "'Though you insist on playing the fool,' Gorm said, "'I see that your intellect is keen and your skills are unparalleled. There is much good you could do from a seat of power. Stay with me and let me put you at the head of my armies.' Gorm's eyes glazed over as he pictured his banners flapping triumphantly over the Holy Land. Train my men, William. Lead them to glorious victory over the Saracens. He broke from his reverie when he realized William had not responded. Turning, he saw William backing out of the light, his chest heaving with scarcely suppressed laughter. Gorm's eyes flashed dangerously. Forgive my impertinence, my lord, but can you imagine me at the head of armies? I am as unfit to command as your daughter. I do not have a daughter, Gorm growled. Exactly. You have earned the love and respect of all who fight for you through a generation of gallant service and noble leadership. I cannot claim any such accolades of my own, and therefore neither command nor deserve the respect afforded you. Your men worship you, Gorm objected. My men follow me because they are mostly untrained soldiers. I wear a pretty suit of armor, and they assume I am someone worth following. You are a leader. I am merely a novelty. 
I need not explain the difference to you. Gorm dropped his eyes in disappointment. William crossed the tent and placed a hand on his shoulder. You do me much honor, my friend. I will never forget your kind hand and understanding heart. I hope that I may be guided by your example all the days of my life. I will feel your loss mightily, William, Gorm said, tears springing to his eyes. That is only because you have a mighty heart. Spare me not a moment's thought. William squeezed the older man's shoulder warmly. William, Gorm called as William departed, if you are ever in need, remember that I am here. Chapter 3 The Kingdom of Jerusalem Cresson near Nazareth Attack! Henry roared. The cavalry bolted toward Al Afdal's retreating forces. Sir Henry, no! Roger de Mouillons insisted. Al Afdal is retreating, Sir Roger. I will not miss this opportunity. It is a trap. Al Afdal's father, Saladin, has used this tactic many times against the Crusaders. You insult me by implying that I cannot tell a feint from a rout, Henry snorted. Very well. Remain here if you will, but I will not allow Al Afdal to simply retreat into the night after attacking us. Now is our chance, and I will see victory this day. Charge! he shouted at the infantry, piqued that they were not already following the cavalry in Al Afdal's forces. Henry spurred his mount and raced ahead of the foot soldiers. A significant space had opened up between him and the chivalry in the precious moments he had lost arguing with that fool Roger de Mouillons. The knights ahead of him were driving hard to overtake the retreating Saracen forces, and Henry was not closing ground fast enough to catch them. He glanced over his shoulder and noticed an increasingly large gap opening up between the infantry and the knights. He was alone in the middle without the protection of either group. He debated momentarily about dropping back with the infantry, but he belonged at the head of the chivalry, and he was not about to miss the thrill of victory in the first full-scale battle in which he was in charge. Just as he was putting his head down to press his horse on ever faster, he saw something that turned his stomach to ice. Another arm of Al Afdal's army was sweeping down out of the hills to cut off the knights from the infantry. Roger had been right. It was a trap. Henry had no choice but to drop back and fight with the foot soldiers. What had seemed an easy victory only moments before had now deteriorated to a scrambling defensive action. Sir Henry! Over here! Over here! Henry heard the call over the cascading sounds of steel striking steel, men screaming in pain, and shouted cries across the battlefield. For the moment, however, he was occupied answering another of the incessant pleas for help. He offered what assistance he could to the man at his feet, which was nothing more than handing him a piece of dirty cloth to help staunch the bleeding from his leg, and then turned to look for his new petitioner. He slashed through a Saracen in front of him while searching frantically for the source of the cries. "'Sir Henry, please hurry!' Another enemy approached from his right, and Henry cut him down as well. How he wished he still had his horse so he could look from above to find those who most needed him. Wading through the battle as he was, he was simply not effective. "'Help, Sir Henry! Here! Here!' Henry rammed through a group of soldiers and found Patrick, a young footman in the infantry fighting alone. He had lost his weapon and leapt in desperation at his Saracen opponent. Surprised by the act, the pair grappled briefly, but the Saracen threw Patrick onto his back in the dirt. He smiled and raised his sword over the boy who curled up helplessly at his feet. No! Henry shouted instinctively, hoping to draw the Moor's attention. Curled as he was, with his hands raised to cover his face, Patrick didn't see the blade that slid into his back and pierced his heart. Henry reached them and swung his scimitar so ferociously that the Moor's head flew from his shoulders before he even had a chance to pull his own sword from Patrick's body. Henry dropped to his knees and yanked the weapon free. He hurled it into the melee and rolled Patrick's body over, afraid of what he would see. The young man had a surprised look on his face, but his eyes were lifeless and blood was trickling from his nose and mouth. Tears sprang to Henry's eyes and he beat his fist on the ground. Why? God help me, why? He was just a boy! Consumed by his pain, he was only dimly aware of the battle raging around him. His cavalry was gone, and his infantry were being driven steadily back. The spot where he knelt had once been the front line, but it was now overrun by enemy troops. Heedless of his vulnerable position, Henry hugged the boy's body to his chest, wondering how he was going to explain his death to his family. Henry had felt responsible for him since he had joined the army en route to Jerusalem, 
the same day that Gerard de Riedfurt had perished and Henry had assumed command. Henry had always harbored a dream of championing a young man and watching him advance through the ranks under his wise tutelage. Patrick represented a fulfillment of that dream. Come with us, boy, Henry had pronounced loud enough for all to hear. March with forces of God against the heathens that have taken the Holy Land. It will be dangerous, but you will be in my care. The boy's aging mother had exacted an oath from Henry that he would protect her last remaining son. Of course, he could have just taken the boy as a conscript, but such a bullish act did not fit the vision of how he would come by his champion. Nobly granting his word as knight of the realm that her son would be protected, however, fit nicely with that vision. But now the boy was dead, while Henry, his sworn protector, yet lived. How can this be? How can any of this be happening? He cried silently to the heavens. How can the first real battle in which I lead the army be ending in utter defeat? Am I not righteous enough? A Saracen soldier noticed Henry kneeling over Patrick's body and rushed in to take advantage of his exposed position. The Moor swung his mace in what he expected to be an easy kill. His enthusiasm turned to fear, however, when Henry's scimitar flashed up and parried the blow with so much force the soldier had a hard time maintaining hold of his weapon. Henry rose, fury distorting his long face. Though lean, Henry stood a head taller than the average Saracen and was clearly possessed. He drew his sword back for a brutal swing that he made no effort to conceal. The terrified Moor raised his mace in defense, but to no avail. The force of Henry's strike buckled the Saracen's wrist, sliced through his broken guard, and then slid cleanly through his throat. Henry stopped and wiped his eyes with the back of his hand. Again he examined the battle and gritted his teeth in frustration. His men were still falling back. I have to move, he thought. We must regroup. Furious with the way the battle was progressing, he turned back toward his line. Swinging wildly in every direction, he cut through the enemies that stood between him and his men. "'To me, men!' he ordered. "'Form up around me!' As the men struggled to get into position, Henry looked for familiar faces among them. Their numbers were few, but he still had several good soldiers. "'Stand together, men!' he shouted. "'The day may yet be—' His voice trailed off when he noticed a familiar form deep behind the Saracen line. There, sitting on horseback, protected by a sea of infantry around him, was a giant, long, stringy black hair, just as Henry remembered him. His skin was lighter than the Saracen soldiers he was directing, but not so light that he could not be one of them. The giant met Henry's stare. A smile twisted the scar on his cheek before he pointed at Henry and shouted orders. A unit of Saracen troops turned and rushed to Henry's position. A low guttural sound drawn from the depths of his very soul erupted from Henry. This enormous devil was his oldest enemy. They had first encountered one another when Henry was scarcely more than a child. Henry had been at Donning Castle and was called to assist in putting down a revolt. Though the men fighting against his family were not well trained or equipped, it was a bloody battle led by this giant. The revolt had failed, but left many dead and nearly cost Henry's youngest brother his life. Now here was the same giant, again attempting to destroy Henry. The latest swarm of enemies directed by the giant hit Henry's feeble line, and they were forced back under the onslaught. "'Stand strong, men! Remember what you are fighting for!' he yelled, even as he had to retreat several steps. "'We fight for God in the Holy Land!' Whether Henry's men did not hear his words or were simply unable to respond, he did not know. But even as he implored them to stand strong, they folded. Any attempt at a measured retreat crumbled into a full-scale rout as his men turned and ran from the Saracen army. "'You fools! Turn and defend yourselves!' Henry shouted at them, but no one was listening. He fell back several more yards, turned to try and fend off his pursuers, and then fell back again. All was chaos now. Those who tried to stand and fight stood alone and were instantly overwhelmed. Those who fled made easy targets for the Saracens. Henry tried to find a balance between fighting and fleeing for his life. He knew he had to stay near what little was left of his line or he too would be overwhelmed, but even the men who stood with him were being cut to pieces and he was powerless to stop it. He gritted his teeth in frustration. His men had done this to themselves. If they would only have acted as a united front, they could have prevented this slaughter, but they would not. 
Each man was only interested in his own self-preservation, and ironically, by trying to escape without his comrades, he was guaranteeing that they all die. Lord, Henry prayed aloud, let my men see what they are doing to themselves. Please protect us and the cause for which we are fighting. He continued to retreat before the advancing army, his frustration quickly turning to desperation as two more Saracens took the spot of the one he'd just killed. Fifty paces away, the giant ordered more men to concentrate on Henry, forcing him to retreat another ten yards. Henry searched frantically for more men with whom he could make a stand. To his left, he saw Charles, one of his officers, fighting alone. But before Henry could cross the short distance to help him, Charles was overrun as if by a pack of dogs. Charles! Henry screamed helplessly. He turned away from the slaughter, only to see Alston, one of his sergeants, just holding back a small group of moors. Henry started to push in that direction. Alston, to me! To me! he shouted. But Alston gave no indication that he heard. Again, Henry fell back a few steps, but he was determined to reach his sergeant before it was too late. He pressed harder against the horde in front of him and watched as more of his men fell. They were dropping everywhere he looked. But Alston was still on his feet and fighting. He was a seasoned warrior, but more importantly, the men respected him. Maybe, he thought, between the two of us we can rally the men and survive the day. Another man fell. One of the Saracen troops before Henry grew weary of sparring with him and swung a wild, desperate blow. It went wide and Henry sidestepped it easily before cutting the man down with a smooth cross-stroke. Another Saracen watched his comrade fall, grimaced and stabbed at Henry's belly, but was forced to leap back mid-swing to stay clear of Henry's repost. As he leapt backward, he tripped over his fallen friend and landed in the dirt behind Alston, who was still furiously engaged in a struggle for his life. The path to Alston was now clear and Henry lunged forward to join his sergeant. He didn't get two steps, however, before he was again barred by new challengers from the giant's men. The moor who had tripped and fallen scrambled to his feet. Henry saw what was about to happen. Alston! Behind you! Behind you! he yelled. But again, he had no way of knowing if Alston heard him. Either way, he did not turn. Henry plowed into the men in front of him. He knocked them off balance and dodged their clumsy blows, but could do nothing to save his friend. Alston dropped to his knees, blood already running from under his armor. The assassin turned and smiled at Henry, then disappeared into the ranks of his comrades. No! Henry screamed. He couldn't believe any of this was happening. It was like some horrific dream from which he could not awaken. He searched desperately for a stronghold of knights that were still fighting, but he could not see any. He was alone. He turned and sprinted away from the line of Saracen soldiers. There were just too many of them, and he was a dead man if he did not escape. He heard the giant bark orders to his men and then groaned as hundreds of Saracen soldiers began pursuing him. There was not much time. If he kept running, they would catch him and kill him, but if he turned to face them, they would overwhelm him. Father, please rescue us from this. Spare your servants that they might live to fight another day. Rescue me! Henry rounded an impromptu barrier of wagons and rubble and saw that a group of his soldiers had assembled and formed a small line. They were being driven back away from him, but at least they were still fighting. Surely these men were an answer to his prayers. Henry ran to join them. Take heart, men! We may yet prevail! His relief at finding them boosted his energy, and he quickly dispatched another Saracen. But then the Moors that had followed him caught up and swarmed Henry and his small group. The line that had been barely able to hold before collapsed under the stress of the additional enemies. So glad to see you, Sir Henry! A voice muttered through teeth clenched in exertion. Henry did not have a chance to identify the speaker, as most of this group, too, turned and fled. He screamed at them to stand and fight, but they just kept running. Another small group of crusaders saw Henry and the seven men who were still with him and rushed over to reinforce them. By the time they reached him, however, three of the seven were dead. Together, the group retreated a few paces. At Henry's command, they stopped and fought again. Henry deflected another enemy blade, but was dismayed to feel his weapon growing noticeably heavier in his hand. The long day of battle, as well as his flight and impending defeat, were beginning to take their toll. He glanced to each side and saw that his men were also struggling. Victory in battle energized a man, but losing sucked his energy like blood leaking from an open wound. He and his men were feeling the effects of defeat, and unless something changed, they would be struck down. It was up to him to give his men hope. 
Grimacing, Henry rallied his strength and forced himself forward, hoping the movement looked like he was pushing their enemies back. The men saw Henry advance and took heart. Struggling though they were, they too managed to step up until they were shoulder to shoulder with him. Henry attempted to dispatch his opponent and take another step forward, but this Saracen was a particularly able swordsman who deftly parried each of his strikes. Henry was beginning to fear that he had finally met his match when he saw the men with him push forward and passed him. His ruse had worked. His men were fighting with renewed vigor and had actually managed to push the enemy back. Henry felt a surge of strength at this. He fainted to his opponent's left and ran his sword into the Saracen's belly when he took the bait. He smiled in relief, but his victory was short-lived. A tidal wave of nausea swept over him and he doubled over and retched. Staring at the pool of vomit at his feet, Henry shuddered. This was an omen that all men that fought in this part of the world knew well. It was an early sign of heat exhaustion. If he did not find rest and water soon, he would collapse entirely and die of exposure, even if he did manage to survive the enemy's swords. Panting and searching for some reprieve, Henry glanced behind him and saw three groups of men milling about as if unsure where they should go or what they should do. Imbeciles! I am literally running myself to death in front of them and they are just standing around! Without thinking, he turned and ran toward them. To me, men! To me! he yelled, but they did not seem to notice. Men! he shouted, but still he received no response. Henry glanced back at the line he had left and bellowed in frustration. Seeing their leader run from the line had diminished whatever valor his initial surge had inspired. As a result, they became confused and their line broke down. The Saracens wasted no time cutting them off from each other and overwhelming them. Henry spun and ran a few steps back toward them, but realized even as he did so that by himself he was helpless and would also be killed. He needed to gather his men. Unity was their only hope. He again turned away from the front and continued toward the other groups of soldiers, shouting at them all the while. He was not the only one to spot the milling soldiers, however. The giant was already ordering his men to attack them and, because of Henry's hesitation, they were a step ahead. The Saracens swarmed into the groups of knights and destroyed them before they had a chance to regroup. Henry cursed. An uncontrollable rage seized him and drove him in a wild frenzy toward the nearest group of enemies. It is over, a calm but firm voice said. Whether he had actually heard it, or if it had only been a voice in his head, Henry could not be certain. But either way, the words had a calming effect on him that kept him from rushing impulsively back into battle. He slowed to a halt and looked around. He knew the voice was right. There was nothing more to be done here. The day was lost, his forces were defeated, and nothing he could do would change that. He hesitated only a moment more before running from the field. As Henry fled, he passed another group of knights who had been cut off by the enemy. The men recognized him and several called out for help. They were surrounded and on the verge of being overwhelmed. Henry froze in uncertainty. The group was done for, one glance told him that. If he jumped into the fray now, he might be able to stave off their deaths for a few moments, but then all of them would surely die, himself included. On the other hand, could he leave a brother in need? He took a step toward them and stopped. Hen! The shrill cry was cut off sharply as the soldier was struck down. Henry swore and continued to run from the field. The day was lost, and so were the men who had counted on him to lead them to victory. He reached the top of a hill overlooking the battlefield and stopped, tears streaming down his face. Why have you forsaken your soldiers on your errand? he demanded of God. Why? Between sobs he cursed Jerusalem, the Moors, and the giant who led them. Ashamed, he cursed himself for being alive. Pain and disgrace filled him as he fled Croissant.